Good morning, everyone. And um, we had our first technological glitch um, since we've started this program. And unfortunately, the presentations from Dr. Uh, Maiachi, uh, as well as our discussions from UCLA was cut off uh, due to problems related to the platform um, of um, uh, this webinar program. Um, fortunately, this has, um, has been corrected and um, we're happy to have both um, Dr. Maiachi uh, as well as Dr. Shambak uh, for this program. Um, we have many of the questions that were uh, registered from that program, many of them related to specifics of Dr. Maiachi's presentation. Um, so I will be getting to those um, as we uh, finish up the formal presentation and ask for, um, uh, for, in particular, for his responses. I would ask that if you have any additional questions as you listen to the program this morning, please put those in and um, I will do my best to get to those by the end of the hour. And so it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Akira Maiachi, who's president and chief operating officer of Kuma Hospital in Kobe, Japan. Um, this is a position that he has had held since 2001. For those of you who don't know, Kuma Hospital um, is uh, perhaps one of the most famous endocrine um, and specifically thyroid centers in the world. Uh, Dr. Maiachi uh, is an endocrine surgeon who has earned his uh, PhD in addition to his MD at Osaka University Medical School. And in addition to his role at Kuma Hospital, he also served as president of the International Association of Endocrine Surgeons, as well as chairman of the Asian Association of Endocrine Surgeons. In addition to the nearly 1,300 thyroid cancer surgeries performed at Kuma Hospital every year, Dr. Maiachi has really been at the very forefront of the paradigm shift toward active surveillance for low-risk thyroid cancer. This um, change in practice um, and our management has had a, just an absolutely profound impact on thyroid cancer worldwide. And so, Dr. Maiachi, first of all, we apologize for the interruption in the program two weeks ago, and we thank you for joining us again um, uh, this morning. And, um, and then, as we do on a weekly basis, uh, we have a discussion um, this morning from uh, the, the west coast of California, of um, the United States in UC, at UCLA. Um, Dr. Libitz is an assistant professor of surgery and director of the Endocrine Surgery Fellowship Training Program at UCLA. And um, in addition, Max, uh, Dr. Max Shum, is um, a surgery resident at UCLA Medical Center, where he's currently in his second year of research training. Um, research interests uh, for Dr. Shum include surgical outcomes, optimizing treatment for thyroid cancer, and patient reported outcomes and quality of life. So I thank both of you for rejoining us, and we're gonna go ahead and resume the program at this time, and then entertain all of your questions um, at the end here. I'm going to get to as many as I possibly can. Uh, this is Akira Miyauchi uh, speaking from Kobe, Japan. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mark Aken, for inviting me to the this uh, Thyroid Journal Club. Well, my talk for today is a uh, marked decrease over time in conversion surgery after active surveillance of low-risk papillary microcarcinoma. Well, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, you know, during the recent three decades, the incidence of thyroid cancer increased rapidly in many countries. The increase mostly due to in detection of small papillary thyroid cancers. Uh, papillary microcancer, one centimeter or smaller became nearly half of the cases. However, mortality from thyroid cancer remained stable. Therefore, many researchers suggested overdiagnosis and overtreatment of small papillary thyroid cancer. The, regarding papillary microcancers, many autopsy studies on subjects who died on non thyroid diseases reported high incidences of latent thyroid cancer. 
if we look at this side of the uh, Latin side of cancer, larger than three millimeter in size, which can be easily detected when diagnosed with ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration, two to six percent instances are reported. Dr. Takebe in Japan conducted a screening studies for thyroid cancer with ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration and he found that 3.5% of Japanese adult women having small thyroid cancer. This instance was consistent with the incidence of latent thyroid cancer, and more than 1,000 times the prevalence of clinical thyroid cancer in Japanese women being reported at that time. With, the, with this huge discrepancy, I had an hypothesis that most papillary microcarcinomas would remain small. However, some of papillary microcancers will grow. The issue is how can we identify the minority that progress? I thought observation without immediate surgery will tell the answer. And doing surgery only for those that show slight progression would not be too late. And doing uh, immediate surgery for all papillary microcancers might result in more harm than good. With these considerations, I propose an observation without immediate surgery clinical trial at Kuma Hospital in 1993, 27 years ago. This trial became uh, later called act, uh, active surveillance data. We made a diagnosis with ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration, which is very accurate. For high risk papillary microcancers, we recommended surgery, and for low risk papillary microcancers, we proposed observation and surgery, and patients chose one of them. Patients who chose observation were followed with ultrasound six months later and once a year thereafter. We recommended surgery if the tumor showed an increase in size by three millimeter or more, or if noble lymph node metastasis appeared. High risk papillary microcancer was defined as having one or more of the following lymph node metastasis or distant metastasis, extrathyroid extension, or high grade cytology. We cautiously included tumors located near the recurrent ranger nerve or attaching the trachea in high, uh, in high risk category. Low risk papillary microcancer was defined as having none of the above features. We did not exclude patients with family history for papillary thyroid cancer and patients with multiple foci from the candidate of active surveillance. This figure shows risk of active surveillance according to the location of microcancer. If the tumor uh, locates, uh, if the tumor is solitary and surrounded by uh, normal thyroid tissue, it is an ideal case. If the tumor is multiple or tumor uh, possibly invading the anterior or lateral thyroid capsule or tumor attaching the trachea forming sharp uh, uh, acute angle or tumor uh, located rather near to the recurrent ranger nerve, but there is normal ring between the uh, tumor and the recurrent ranger nerve. We think these are appropriate cases. We can include uh, for active surveillance. However, if the tumor adhere to the uh, trachea forming obtuse angle and tumor located in the direction of the recurrent ranger nerve without normal thyroid rim. These cases are inappropriate. We should recommend surgery. Well, in 2014, we reported the outcome of our clinical trial on 1,235 patients. Please note, 5% of the patient had a family history for papillary thyroid cancer, and 12% of the patient had multiple foci. Well, during the active surveillance at 10 years, 8% of the patients showed tumor enlargement by three millimeter or more. And, and 
At 10 years, 3.8% of the patients showed lymph node metastasis. When I uh, proposed uh, this trial, of course, I knew elderly patients with clinical papillary thyroid cancer had poor prognosis. So I had a slight concern in including elderly patients in active surveillance trial. However, uh, when we looked at the age at presentation, the, the, the result was completely different from what was concerned. I mean, the patients younger than 40 years tended to show tumor enlargement, while patients older than 60 years were less likely to show tumor enlargement, and middle aged were between, uh, between these. Multivariate analysis on factors for size enlargement showed only young age was the significant factor, and family history and multiple foci were not. Regarding the appearance of lymph node metastasis, again, patients younger than 40 years tended to show lymph node metastasis, while middle-aged and elderly patients were less likely to show lymph node metastasis. Multivariate analysis on factors for lymph node metastasis revealed that only young age was the significant factor, and family history and multiple foci were not significant factors. During this eight-year period, 2,153 patients with low-risk papillary microcancer were seen at Kuma Hospital. 55% of them uh, chose observation and 45% of them underwent uh, immediate surgery. After surgery, five patients had local recurrence, which was successfully treated with surveyed surgery. After surgery, five patients died of other diseases. So these patients were alive without evidence of disease. Among the observation group, 8% of them underwent conversion surgery for various reasons. And after surgery, one patient had a local recurrence, which was successfully treated. During the observation, three patients died of other diseases. Most importantly, more than 1,000 patients were alive without cancer progression. Therefore, oncological outcomes of these treatment modalities were similarly excellent. However, if we look at the instances of unfavorable events such as temporary and permanent vocal cord paralysis, temporary and permanent hypoparathyroidism, patients on level thyroxine, and patients with surgical skull, these instances were significantly higher in immediate surgery group than active surveillance group. We calculated the total cost of management for 10-year period according to the actual flow at Kuma Hospital. The cost included cost for conversion surgery. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. The cost for conversion surgery and cost for uh, recurrent disease treatment. And we found that uh, immediate surgery the uh, cost was 4.1 times the cost of active surveillance. Regarding conversion surgery, in our uh, early period study, the conversion rate was as high as 32%, but the second period, it decreased to 8%. And uh, other researchers reported 3.4% uh, to 16% 16, 16 instance uh, reported. The important thing is the reason of conversion. The main reason of uh, conversion was not due to the tumor enlargement or lymph node metastasis, but for other reasons. So I asked my young colleague, uh, Takahiro Sasaki, to analyze the uh, conversion surgery. And he found that uh, there were market decrease over time in conversion surgery. From February uh, 2005, when we 
adopted electronic medical recording system at Kuma Hospital to June uh, 2017, 2,288 patients with low risk papillomycin micro cancer underwent active surveillance at Kuma Hospital. Patients were regularly followed with ultrasound and tumor size were measured with ultrasound. Tumor volume was calculated using ellipsoid equation. And then we calculated doubling rate using uh, our calculator. And this calculator can be downloaded from the website of Kuma Hospital. It is free. You know, the doubling time is well validated uh, to analyze and express uh, changes in tumor volume over time. However, it has two major limitations. First, if the tumor shows, some of the tumor shows a decrease in tumor volume over time, the doubling time for these cases are given in negative values. This creates a problem of discontinuity from the positive values. The second, the magnitude of doubling time value is opposite to the magnitude of growth rate. If we take inverse of doubling time, these limitations are resolved. I propose uh, calling this index doubling rate since it indicates number of doublings that occur uh, in, in unit time. Well, Using doubling rate, we were able to show uh, tumor volume kinetics of the papillary micro cancer during active surveillance. Uh, positive value indicates tumor growth, and large value indicates rapid growth. And negative value indicates decrease in tumor volume, and each column indicates uh, each patient. During active surveillance, only 3% of the tumors showed rather rapid growth and 22% showed slow growth and 57% showed stable disease and very interestingly, 17% of the tumors showed decrease in their tumor volume over time. Regarding suspicious lymph node, lymph node in the neck are often shaped like a deflated rugby ball. We think depth is more important than length or width when consider indication of finding the special for suspicious lymph nodes. When we perform FNA, we also measure thyroglobin on the washout of the needle. We divided the, our study period in two. Uh, the first half period included uh, 561 patients, and among them, 81 patients had conversion surgery. In the second half period, there were 1,727 patients, and incidentally, the same number of patients underwent conversion surgery. Our definition of disease progression is uh, tumor enlargement by three millimeter or more, or novel appearance of lymph node metastasis. This was not changed since 1993. Well, uh, in the present study period, 3,769 patients with low risk papillary micro cancer were seen at Kuma Hospital. 40% of them underwent immediate surgery and 60% of them chose active surveillance and 7.1% of them had conversion surgery due to disease progression, either tumor enlargement or nodal metastasis, patient's preference, physician's preference, uh, surgical indication of associated thyroid or parathyroid diseases or other reasons. Uh, patient's uh, preference, I'll sleep, no. No, cancer is. Cancer, okay, okay. Uh, patient's preference, uh, during this long time period, many physicians uh, saw patients and some physicians uh, uh, tended to recommend uh, conversion surgery for minor reasons. Well, this will compare clinical characteristics of 
uh, patient preference group, disease progression group, and uh, physician's group preference group. By some reason, physician's preference group included only uh, female patients. And uh, tumor size at diagnosis were not significantly different among patients uh, among three groups. And however, the disease progression group had uh, larger tumor size at surgery and the higher tumor volume doubling rate. This is reasonable. However, very interestingly, 28% uh, of the patient preference group and 16% of physician's preference group had decrease in tumor over time. And among the disease progression group, 5% of the tumors showed a decrease in tumor volume over time, but uh, these two uh, cases showed uh, lymph node metastasis. Well, uh, this uh, table shows clinical features comparing tumor enlargement group and appearance of lymph node metastasis group. Patients who had lymph node metastasis had uh, younger age than tumor patient who had tumor enlargement. Uh, this is consistent with our previous report. And uh, patient who had tumor enlargement had a larger uh, tumor at uh, surgery and uh, higher tumor volume double rate. Uh, this is quite reasonable. Uh, this figure shows cumulative rate of conversion surgery in the first half and second half period group. You can see uh, the cumulative conversion rate decreased to one third in the second half period. Uh, regarding the patient preference group, again, the conversion rate decreased to one fourth in the second half period. Uh, this is the physician's preference group. Again, uh, the conversion rate decreased to about 40% in the uh, second half period. Regarding disease progression, uh, also uh, disease progression also decreased in the uh, second half period. This requires some explanation because we did not change our de definition of disease progression. Well, when we look at the patient with the tumor enlargement, uh, there was no difference in the first half group and second half group in the, in the tumor size at diagnosis. However, uh, tumor size at surgery was one millimeter larger in the second half period and the difference between the tumor size at the surgery and the, that at diagnosis was also one millimeter larger. Although this did not reach significant. Uh, regarding the lymph node metastasis, lymph node size, especially depth, was significantly larger in second half period, indicating we observe, continue observing uh, suspicious lymph node until it reaches some size. Well, although definition of disease progression was not changed, however, over time, with accumulation of favorable outcomes, we gradually shifted to continue active surveillance for slightly enlarged tumors and mildly suspicious lymph nodes according to patient's preference. We think we can wait until tumor exceed 13 millimeter or uh, larger tumor size uh, suspicious lymph node appear. Well, this figure shows changes in the frequency of active surveillance by year at Kuma Hospital from 1993. Uh, you can see the proportion of active surveillance among the candidate patients gradually increased over time and recently it reached to 
about 95%. This figure shows changes in the frequency of active surveillance by year according to surgeons. Surgeon A uh, favored active surveillance very much from the beginning, but uh, Surgeon B uh, did not like active surveillance. Uh, but uh, at the end, he changed slightly. He changed mind his mind slightly. Sergeant C and D are between these. So you understand that uh, there was significantly significant difference in the preference of active surveillance according to surgeons or physicians. Well, I have another question. Do papillary micro cancers continue growing after they reach the point of tumor enlargement? Uh, this figure shows changes in tumor doubling rate of papillary micro cancer before and after the point of enlargement. Point of enlargement uh, defined by uh, increase in size by three millimeter or uh, enlargement by tumor volume uh, increased by 50%. In either definition, the after the uh, af after the point of enlargement, uh, tumor doubling rate decreased significantly, decreased, and some uh, show uh, negative value indicating a decrease in their tumor volume. So, uh, papillary micro cancer can uh, stop growing after the point of tumor uh, enlargement. In conclusion, regardless of the reasons, patients with papillary micro cancer in the later part of our active surveillance study were significantly less likely to undergo conversion surgery than those in the earlier part. Uh, this was probably because of the accumulation of favorable outcome of active surveillance. Uh, significantly contributed to physicians' confidence and patients' trust and understanding of the disease. I think these changes should be a natural reaction when we encounter a new management modality. We hope that our experience can be useful for physicians who have begun or are trying to begin active surveillance for papillary micro cancer. Uh, Warner and Ingber's The Thyro, the 11th edition, was recently published. We were very glad that we were asked to write a chapter on papillary micro cancer. If you need more information on papillary micro cancer, please read this book. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Erkin and the Bank Foundation for the invitation to present today. I'd also like to congratulate Dr. Miyachi and his team for their pioneering work at the Kuma Hospital. I wanna share with you some of our thoughts on the current state of active surveillance for papillary thyroid carcinoma. We have no disclosures. The acceptance of active surveillance as a management strategy for low risk papillary microcarcinoma has been demonstrated to be safe and has grown worldwide. Features of low risk papillary microcarcinoma can be seen on the left of the screen and include a solitary intrathyroidal nodule with well-defined margins, no local invasions or evidence of extrathyroidal extension, and no lymph node metastasis. This is in contrast to lesions with extrathyroidal extension as seen on the right, or other lesions that have features suggestive of invasion of the trachea or a recurrent laryngeal nerve, as well as nodal disease. In active surveillance, delayed intervention in patients requiring conversion surgery has not been associated with adverse outcomes. In this previous study by Ito et al. of 1,200 patients with low-risk papillary microcarcinoma who chose observation without immediate surgery and were followed up for an average of 75 months, the cumulative incidence of disease progression was low. Further, the proportion of patients with PMC progression was lowest in the older patients, as seen by the solid line, and highest in the younger patients, seen up top. No patient showed distant metastasis or died of PTC during observation. 
As you saw in the previous presentation, only 7% of PMC patients treated with active surveillance underwent conversion surgery at a median of two to three years after diagnosis, an overall median follow-up of, of eight years. There was an even lower risk of disease progression for active, during active surveillance in the subgroup. Patients treated in the second half of the study period were significantly less likely to undergo conversion surgery than were those in the first half for all reasons, including disease progression, patient preference, and physician preference. And the conclusion was that a change in practice patterns may have arisen from increased physician confidence and patient trust in understanding the indolent nature of this disease. Compelling data has accumulated that active surveillance management approach is safe and effective alternative to immediate surgical resection in properly selected patients. In this study of 2,100 patients with low-risk papillary microcarcinoma, 1,200 patients underwent observation and 980 patients underwent immediate surgery. In the active surveillance arm, which was who, was, who were followed for 47 months, there were low rates of conversion surgery for disease progression defined as a growth of three millimeters in tumor size or surgery for lymph node metastasis. There were no distant metastases and no death and 20% of patients required thyroid hormone replacement. In one patient who underwent conversion surgery, um, a recurrence was encountered in the lateral neck compartment, which was successfully treated with a modified neck dissection. In the immediate surgery group, also followed for 47 months, 399 patients underwent total thyroidectomy with central neck dissection, and 575 patients underwent lobectomy. The rate of lymph node metastasis was also low in this group, 0.2%. Five patients developed recurrence, of which two developed lymph node metastases in the lateral neck, neck compartment. You can see that although the, the risk of surgical complications or permanent surgical complications is low, they were still present. Further, there were 66% of patients in this group requiring thyroid hormone replacement, which was significantly higher than those in the active surveillance group. We do want to make a point that although these complication rates are reported low here, um, they are likely higher in real world in real world practice since low volume surgeons disproportionately perform the majority of thyroid operations in the United States. Such surmounting data led to the formal endorsement of active surveillance in various international society management guidelines for patients with very low risk tumors, including in Japan, in the United States in 2015, and also in Europe. The ATA guidelines, however, state that no clinical feature or molecular abnormality in isolation can reliably differentiate the relatively small number of papillary microcarcinoma patients destined to develop clinically significant progression from the larger population of patients that harbor indolent papillary microcarcinomas that will not cause significant disease. Brito et al. proposed a framework for risk stratification of patients being considered for observation of PTC. This approach encompasses evaluation of characteristics of the tumor, including the size and location, the patient, which includes their age, comorbidities, and willingness to accept observation, and the medical team, including the availability and experience of a multidisciplinary team. These criteria are then used to stratify patients into ideal, appropriate, and inappropriate candidates for active surveillance. An ideal candidate, for example, would have a solitary, well-defined nodule without extrathyroidal extension. They would be an older patient above the age of 60. They'd be willing to accept active surveillance with, with good social support. They'd have an experienced multidisciplinary team with high quality ultrasound available and prospective data collection. An appropriate candidate may have multifocal papillary microcarcinoma. The tumor may have ill-defined borders or a subcapsular location not adjacent to the recurrent laryngeal nerve and without extrathyroidal extension. The patient could be middle-aged, possibly have childbearing potential, and the patient could be under care with an experienced endocrinologist or thyroid surgeon. Finally, an inappropriate candidate would have evidence of extrathyroidal extension or nodal, nodal disease. The patient would be under the age of 18, not willing to accept active surveillance or unlikely to be compliant with follow-up plans without reliable neck ultrasound available or under the care of a physician with little experience with thyroid cancer management. The US experience, which mostly comes out of Memorial Sloan Kettering from Dr. Dr. Tuttle's group, demonstrates very similar rates of tumor progression for active surveillance 
as the data that Dr. Mayachi presented. In 2019, more than five patients have under, more than 500 patients have undergone active surveillance for papillary thyroid carcinomas of up to two centimeter in size at NSK, with a median follow-up now approximately four years. Total et al. reported their findings from their initial cohort of 291 patients who underwent active surveillance with tumor size of up to 1.5 centimeters. Similar to prior reports, they found low rates of tumor growth and no distant or regional metastasis during surveillance. Tumor growth was defined as an increase in tumor diameter over three millimeters, which was observed in only 3.8% of all study patients during a median active surveillance of 25 months. Three-dimensional measurements of tumor, tumor volume allowed this group to um, earlier identify growth before an increase in tumor diameter. The rates of tumor growth during active surveillance in this U.S. cohort of PTCs measuring 1.5 centimeters or less were low, and serial measurements of tumor volume were concluded to facilitate earlier identification of tumors that will continue to grow and thereby inform the timing of surveillance imaging and therapeutic interventions. In April of 2019, O et al. published a prospective cohort study examining clinical and sonographic predictors of rapid tumor volume doubling time in 273 patients with papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. Patients were stratified into the rapid growing group, which was defined as a tumor volume under five years, tumor volume double time of under five years, or a stable group, which was defined as a tumor volume double time over five years. This was based on the rate of growth observed over serial ultrasound measurements with a median follow-up time of 42 months. The tumor volume in the rapid growing group increased over time as seen in figure A, while the tumor volume in the stable group remained steady as seen in figure B. Predictors of rapid tumor growth included age under 50 years and the presence of microcalcifications. This study further confirmed that active surveillance is safe for certain patients with PTC and supported previous findings on the predictive significance of tumor volume kinetics in patient age. A recent study assessed the incidence of differentiated thyroid cancer from 2004 to 2016 um, to project the identification of patients eligible for active surveillance in the United States. This study found that um, 50,000 patients in the United States alone with PMC under one centimeter could be eligible for active surveillance over the next five years. This number increased to 67,000 patients when active th surveillance threshold size increased to 1.5 centimeters. However, the ATA guidelines in 2015 recommend avoiding FNA in nodules under one centimeter in diameter without high risk features. So it is possible that fewer PMCs potentially eligible for active surveillance may be identified cytologically in the future. The durability of active surveillance is another important consideration. Nearly half of the patients in Dr. Mayachi's study who underwent conversion surgery did so because of patient or physician preference rather than other indications such as disease progression, showing that the decision for surgery is highly influenced by subjective factors. This highlights the importance of patient and physician counseling and education. Though appropriate patient selection is critical in performing active surveillance, other aspects must be taken into consideration when instituting this treatment modality. These include multidisciplinary care experience, high quality neck ultrasound and understanding of tumor kinetics, tracking enrolled patients and ensuring adequate follow-up, shared decision-making and mutual trust, and finally, physician-patient discussion. In this study by Brito et al., a tool, a, a tool was developed to support conversations between clinicians and patients with PMCs considering treatment options in Korea. Both clinics had the expertise to offer active surveillance as well as immediate surgery. One clinic was trained in the use of the conversation aid, while the other clinic continued to care for patients without access to this conversation aid. Overall, 84% of their patients opted for active surveillance, but patients in the conversation aid group were more likely to choose active surveillance than patients in the usual care clinic, the relative risk of 1.16. These, these results suggest that a key aspect of instituting active surveillance protocols is the discussion that must take place between physician and patient. 
In this Sears database study, tumor size, staging information, and survival data for cases of differentiated thyroid cancer between 2004 and 2014 was queried. As you can see in the chart, the authors found that increasing tumor size does not affect survival until a threshold of about 2.5 centimeters is reached. These findings suggested that recommended size thresholds to biopsy low suspicion thyroid nodules could be increased. The role of molecular testing is another important topic for future PMC research. BRAF and TERP promoter mutations are known to have prognostic values in PTC. In a study performed by Zhu et al. of 123 patients with differentiated thyroid cancer and distant metastases, 15 patients had low risk histology, which was defined as no poorly differentiated component, no gross extrathyroidal extension, um, no extensive vascular invasion over four foci, and no significant lymph node metastases. Molecular analysis was, per was performed in eight cases. In these eight cases, a RAS mutation was found in five, a TERT mutation found in six, and a com combination of TERT with a BRAF or RAS mutation in four. The authors concluded that differentiated thyroid cancer that lacks high-risk features has very low rate of distant metastases. However, there is a fear of active surveillance in the very rare case of a distant metastasis that is missed. Local disease progression can be picked up with serial high quality cervical ultrasound, but the very rare case with distant metastasis will not be, be picked up and would have a significant adverse outcome for the patient. Again, this is rare with low risk DTC and overtreatment is not recommended for these patients. There are still limited studies regarding the relationship between these mutations and papillary microcarcinoma growth. And it's important to note that a BRAF status taken in isolation has a low positive predictive value for detecting more aggressive PMC. In this recent study by Pereira et al, samples from 40 patients with lateral neck nodal metastasis or PN1B disease and 71 patients with intrathyroidal PMC with documented absence of nodal disease, PN0, were used to assess the DNA alterations in 410 genes commonly mutated in cancer. The genomic landscapes of PMC with, with or without nodal disease were similar in this study. Mutations in the TERP promoter occurred in 3% of samples and TP53 in 1% of samples and were exclusive to N1B cases. Although these tests are expensive and it is currently not cost effective to perform molecular testing on, on every patient, future studies are expected to establish the impact of molecular testing involving multiple mutations or other genetic alterations on the clinical impact of patients with PMC. I wanna thank you again for your attention and to the Think Foundation for the invitation to discuss this topic today. Great. Uh, well, thank you both. Um, I'd like to uh, try to get to as many questions as I can here. And I think a follow-up to Dr. Maiochi related to um, the role of molecular markers in uh, Japan and in particular um, in this population of patients, whether that currently or has been used at all in um, advising patients as to the safety of um, active surveillance. At Kuma Hospital, uh, we think uh, the active surveillance, we recommend active surveillance as the first line management for low risk papilla micro cancer. I mean, the, our, our definition of low risk papilla micro cancer is defined, presented uh, this morning, uh, with uh, tumors without. Uh, metastasis or invasion to surrounding tissue and uh, uh, no uh, cytological high-grade cytology and the tumors uh, not located near the trachea or the recurrent angina. So that's uh, our definition of low-risk papilla medical cancer. Um, and do you do molecular testing at this point? Um, to assist at all, or or have you? Is that not part of your current management? Well, we are 
uh, at the practical practical setting, we are, we do not do molecular testing, but uh, as a research, we uh, checked the the instance of BRAF mutation and TART mutation, and among the three groups of uh, papillary micro cancer, one group was a uh, tumor uh, that did not show any disease progression, but underwent surgery by some reason. The second group was a tumor that showed enlargement during the uh, active surveillance. The third group, the tumor showed uh, uh, lymph node metastasis. Uh, the instance of BRAF mutation was all, uh, not significantly different, about 60% uh, and 70%. And we did not find any a mutation on TART uh, in any of the, these three groups. So I do not think BRAF and TART mutation may not be so useful. Okay, all right, terrific. Um, the one, one of the questions uh, relates to how long you will um, advise patients to undergo uh, routine ultrasound is that who choose elect active surveillance uh, do you continue that for life um, and how how often um, perhaps uh, when a patient reaches a five years of stability will you will you switch to once a year what's your current protocol well I think uh, lifetime uh, follow-up study should be necessary but if the patients undergo surgery, those patients also requires lifetime uh, follow-up study. Actually, in our series, uh, nearly 50% of the patient required level thyroxine after uh, thyroid operation. So these patients definitely require seeing doctors at certain uh, period. Okay. Um, in light of the fact that up to 50% of your younger population will show um, evidence of disease progression and uh, be converted to surgery, how do you advise them at, um, where, at the outset of this discussion? Um, what, can you sort of delve into that a little bit more deeply here? Well, <clears throat> Uh, today, I showed that uh, uh, disease progression rate decreases over time, middle age, uh, young, middle age, older. So I calculated disease progression rate for uh, each age decade at presentation from their 20s to 70s. Of course, the disease progression rate decreases with age. And this is progression rate at 10 year period. 10 year period. After 10 year period, uh, patients in their 20s go to in their 30s. So, the next uh, 10 year period, the disease progression rate should decrease. So, we can calculate uh, that value. So, uh, I estimated that the uh, patient. Uh, in their 20s at their presentation uh, will have the uh, nearly 50%, actually 49% of disease progression rate in their lifetime. And patients in their 30s will have nearly 75, uh, 25% uh, chance of disease progression in their lifetime. Uh, you might think these values are too high to accept active surveillance but these values indicate even in patients in their 20s, more than 50% of the patients will not require surgery for their lifetime. And in patients patient in their 30s at presentation, uh, I, say, I mean the 75% of the patient will not require surgery for their lifetime. So it's... Uh, I, it depends on the value of the patients. Okay, um, thank you. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about the patients who um, elect to uh, convert to surgery after beginning a protocol of active surveillance? Um, do you have them meet with psychologists or what is, or how, do, how does that interaction actually take place? If somebody comes in and their disease is stable, um, but they choose to undergo uh, delayed surgical intervention. Can you talk about that, how that actually um, is undertaken? Well, uh, by uh, the, the uh, uh, today I showed that the reason of the conversion surgery is number one, uh, patient's preference, change in patient's mind. The second, uh, physician's preference and disease progression, either tumor enlargement or appearance of lymph node metastasis, or uh, some uh, surgical indication of the associated thyroid or parathyroid disease, such as uh, big thyroid nodules or uh, hyperparathyroidism. Well, and the, regarding the patient's preference, anytime if patients uh, prefer uh, conversion surgery, we accept conversion surgery. And uh, regarding the physician's uh, preference, today I showed that uh, pa uh, the uh, patient, uh, the physician's preference decreased in the later part. I think it's due to the uh, physicians uh, become more confident that active surveillance is much better than uh, immediate surgery. So, uh, the when we see the suspicious lymph node, we this is a rather uh, tricky. The time of the uh, appearance of lymph node metastasis is a time when we insert needle to make diagnosis. You know, the, before that, uh, previous uh, visit, a small, very small suspicious lymph node might be already detected. But uh, if it's not serious, we might continue observing. So the, if the lymph node reaches some size, I think uh, I, I told you that the depth of the lymph node is uh, important. You know, the lymph node in the neck is like a deflated rugby ball, like a, something like this. Uh -huh. Length is not so meaningful. Depth is usually meaningful for or, or performing fine illustration. Well, we think less than five millimeter in depth. Mm, I do, we don't think it's a time to recommend surgery due to the appearance of lymph node metastasis. And okay. in the early period, we try to make uh, detect a lymph node metastasis as early as possible, but we changed our policy gradually not rapid, gradually. Uh -huh. So do you require all of your patients who are undergoing active surveillance to uh, return to Kuma Hospital for their follow-up ultrasounds? Yes, definitely. Has, uh, has uh, that, uh, and, and Dr. Marachi, has that changed during the pandemic? Have you accepted the fact that um, some of your patients may be reluctant to travel? Uh, it's a very good point. Uh, uh, COVID, COVID, uh, coronavirus infection also affect uh, Japanese uh, lifetime, lifestyle. But uh, well, uh, some patients had might skipped uh, the regular checkup. Uh, we recommend. Uh, uh, regular checkup with ultrasound uh, every six months for one or two years, and later uh, once a year. 
but okay. uh, yeah, one, uh, once a year. Okay. And are you, do you, um, have you accepted ultrasounds performed in the community now because of COVID or um, do you still re ask your patients to return? Uh, this is a very good point, but honestly speaking, in the uh, other hospitals or clinics, uh, not so, I'm sorry, but uh, not so reliable or not, not get used to the follow up of the uh, such patients. So uh, at the present time, we do not recommend patients seeing other uh doctors okay i don't think uh, they are uh, uh they are uh, uh, how to say uh, they have enough experience and enough skill sure okay all right can you talk about um just a little bit about the cohort of your patients who have who present with family history um mm -hmm. and Normally, um, many guidelines recommend that with a strong family history that a total thyroidectomy be performed. How does that, what is your philosophy um, on the management of that subgroup of patients? Well, uh, speaking about the family history, uh, in this study, if there are one or more patient or, uh, with a uh, pancreatic thyroid cancer in their family history, we thought it's a familiar case in this study. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a patient and their relatives. But uh, actually, only two patients in one family is not so strong uh, familial cases. Probably you understand. If yeah. there are uh, three, five, for patients in a family that uh, uh, real uh, familial cases, but the majority of our cases are not such cases. Okay, so if um, if somebody presented with two or three first degree family members, would you consider? Um, uh, would you first of all would you consider active surveillance in that patient? And um, that, would that influence you? Yes, uh, that's a very good point. And uh, well, in such cases, I usually uh, listen to the patient uh, the, about the, their uh, uh, course of the uh, uh, relatives. If they are aggressive case, well, of course we should consider immediate surgery. But uh, if they had a very mild disease, well, I I think it uh, they can be also candidate. At Kuma Hospital, I know uh, there are many reports that uh, uh, patient with papillary thyroid cancer with uh, familiar occurrence uh, had a poor prognosis. But uh, regarding the At Kuma Hospital experience, uh, their uh, prognosis is not not worse, quite similar to uh, sporadic cases. So that's our experience. Great. And and could you just comment for just a moment about patients with prior radiation exposure? I suspect that that is a growing population in Japan um, because of the nuclear. Um, problem. Um, are those patients considered candidates for active surveillance? Um, uh, Professor uh, Arkham, uh, you misunderstand about the nuclear power accident. Uh, nuclear power, we had nuclear power accident, but it's uh, the, uh, the extent of uh, pollution is very mild, very low. Uh, uh -huh. Specialists uh, expect there will be no uh, real uh, increase in thyroid cancer in the due to the uh, uh, nuclear power. Uh, I mean, nuclear exposure. Well, that's that's wonderful to to hear. 
Well, I want to, um, we are up against the end of the hour. Uh, this has been incredibly um, educational and um, I'm thrilled that we were able to get to as many questions. Again, I want to apologize to both of you as well as to our audience for the technologic, pro te technological problems that we encountered two weeks ago, but I'm thrilled that we were able to uh, regroup and to be able to address some of these questions and finish up this discussion. Um, Max, congratulations to you and uh, Dr. Mayachi. I, I know I speak for many, many people for the pioneering work that you have done and to congratulate you um, and also to uh, express our gratitude for um, taking the time to, um, uh, to uh, work with us on this program. So thank you both very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and giving me this chance. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Everybody, I hope you'll join us um, again next week on Friday morning. And um, to everybody, stay safe. And um, thank you for being a part of this.